so before I start, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I am not an academic. My credentials do not ring any bells for any of you who are academics. Um, I am a practitioner of campus ministry. Let's put it that way. So I am not presenting a white paper to you. I am not going to uh, try to uh, douse you with any kind of academic or theological or any kind of other intellectual things. I'm going to try to challenge you. That's what I'm going to do. And so up front, I'm telling you this because I hope that when you leave here, uh, if you disagree with me on something, that's fine. I didn't ask anybody to agree with me before you came in here. But I do ask you to at least ponder some of the things I'm going to say. That's all I ask you to do. Like, like Mary took those things that challenged her into her heart, uh, I'm going to challenge some of you. I can guarantee that. And the reason why is because um, I'm somebody who really takes seriously the call to evangelize. I, I really do. And I think that we as Catholics need to take it more seriously, and especially in the mission field of, the, of higher education. So, again, I'm not an academic. Um, and I'm also not looking for anybody to try to replicate the successes that we've had at Texas A&M. So I'm not going to speak unless somebody asks me a question too much on what we do at A&M. That's not what I'm, I'm gonna talk about my personal experiences and I'm gonna talk about some principles and some other things. And the reason why I won't do that is because uh, those of you who are in campus ministry, uh, like myself, I have been the Lone Ranger at Texas Tech before, okay? Spent four years doing that and I know what it's like uh, being by yourself on a huge college campus. And you go to some place that has all the resources in the world and you think to yourself, oh, why aren't we like that? That is not my point uh, by coming to you. And you know, in the introduction, Luke said, hey, you know, it's the biggest campus ministry in the country. That's an old bio. Uh, what I wanna do today, again, is I, I wanna put some stuff out there and I wanna have a conversation at the end, okay? But in the way I put things out there, I'm going to, there are going to be some challenges because I think it's the way we operate as a Catholic church uh, isn't according to the principles the Catholic church has laid out for us. So, because I'm not an academic, we're going to start in prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As if academics don't pray. Jesus, we thank you for the blessing of this day, and we ask that you would send your Spirit down upon us to be with us, to bless us, to guide us as we talk about your church. We thank you, Lord, for this time together, and we pray that this day might be glorifying to you in all we do say, and all of the people who are gathered here in their lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. So let's start off real quick. This is missionary discipleship at, in higher education, right? Especially on public institutions. So missionary discipleship. Where does this phrase come from? It comes straight out of Pope Francis and what he's been talking about. In fact, he has, in a sense, coined the term missionary disciple. He uses it over and over again. It's been in his, in his writings. Um, and it's a beautiful phrase, if you stop and think about it, but it's also one that I think a lot of people have passed over quickly. And what I want to do is I want to put it within a framework of another uh, title, if you will, of discipleship that's been kind of tossed around lately, and that's intentional discipleship, which some of you know from Sherry Waddell, uh, Forming Intentional Disciples. If you haven't read this book, you should read this book because the bishops are reading this book. Um, and how do I know the bishops are reading this book? because for the last, what, four or five years since it's been out, um, it has probably changed the, the, the conversation in, in the USCCB. Um, and because bishops have been giving it to their presbyterate and to their priests in their diocese and then their formation houses. Um, it has really changed a lot of perspective on the church you know, in the United States today. And Sherry, I'm blessed to say she's a friend of mine, and I think the two, intentional disciple and missionary disciple, play well together. So I want to define them for you. Sherry Waddell says that an intentional disciple is somebody who has chosen intentionally to follow Jesus. Now, here's, here's the problem. She, in her book, Forming Intentional Disciples, she, if, you, if you've read the book, you know the first couple of chapters are depressing. How many of you have read the book? Can I get a show of hands real quick? Okay. You know that book's depressing the first couple of chapters. Would you agree? Yes. Because what she does is she lays out the data that the Catholic Church in the United States is dying a quick death. And you cannot fight the data. It is true. 
We see it in our experiences in the church in many places in the United States, don't we? We see it when we're closing parishes, when priests have to take several different places or they have to cluster. We see it when the dwindling numbers of first communions and confirmations you know, per capita. We see it in all the data. We, and you go out and study it, things like less than, well, what is it, 40% of people who are Catholic don't even believe that a personal God exists that God does not care about us, that he's more of a deist kind of God than anything else. So he's far removed from our personal lives and caring about us. These are the kind of statistics that are frightening because self-identified Catholics, therefore, have not chosen intentionally to say, I want to place my life in the service of our God. And part of it comes straight out of our Catholic culture, which we have brought upon ourselves. And so what we need to do is to get back to brass tacks. And what is the message of good news? And what is evangelization? And I will tell you right now, most of us, if you were raised like I was, were raised in good Catholic homes. Meaning your mom and dad went to church every Sunday, you prayed around the, the table, you did all your duties, you did all this stuff. Some of you were not, but I would guess most of you were. But what I'm going to say now is that is not the experience of most people who are coming to Catholic churches today. In higher education, Catholic college students, a majority of them, almost three quarters, will at some point live in a broken home during their adolescence. Before they reach college, in other words, there will be in a one-parent home for part of that time, if not all of it. Think about that for a second. Me, I was, I was blessed to have two parents who have always been married. You know, they've been married for more than 50 years. They're still alive, both of them. And I'll tell you, even in that experience, I walked away from the Catholic Church. Why was it? Because I was not evangelized as a child. And I never had a personal encounter with our God, where I said, I want to follow that God. I want to make God the center of my life. I want to make Jesus my Lord. Now, if this language that I'm even using sounds a little too evangelical Protestant to you, I will tell you right now, it's Catholic. And all you have to do is go look at the saints and the doctors of the church, all you have to do is go look at the writings of our Holy Fathers, and you will see personal relationship with Jesus Christ again and again and again throughout the 2,000 year history of the church. So I want to recapture that language in the Catholic Church because it is at the core of what it means to be a Christian. Not just a Catholic, a Christian is to say, to choose with an act of the will, not just one time though, right? Again and again, I choose to follow Jesus. I woke up this morning and you know what my prayer was? Because my spiritual director told me I had to do it. So you got to do what your spiritual director told you, right? I literally, out loud, said, I trust you, Jesus. She has made me make an act of faith every day at the beginning of my prayer for the last couple of months. You know the fruit that has been born out of that in my own spiritual life has been amazing. But this is not spiritual direction for a public. So, um... <laughs> So here we have the missionary, I mean the intentional disciple, and that's Sherry Waddell. If, in a sense, you could boil it down to disciple. What's a disciple? A follower of Jesus. Simple, right? A missionary disciple is someone who not only chooses to place Jesus at the center of their life, but somebody who then says, my mission rolls out of my identity. I am a disciple, therefore I have a mission. That mission is to share in what Jesus came to do, which was to bring good news to the nations. And what did he tell his apostles right before he flew up into heaven in the ascension? He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That is the mandate of the church. That is the missionary identity of the church. And therefore, it's your missionary identity as members of the church. You and I share that. That's our identity as Catholics. We are called into the mission fields. And if there's any mission field right now, I would argue it's on college campuses especially at public institutions, where 90% of our Catholic college students go is to non-Catholic institutions in this country. Did you know that? 90%. So what are we doing? If you look around the, around the country, most campuses don't have a full-time campus ministry presence. Most campuses. The ones that do are usually poorly staffed, poorly funded, and underutilized. They generally don't have much mission, they don't have much identity, and they have a rolling in and out of personnel. This is generally the norm in most campus ministries. 
I've been doing this for nearly 15 years now, and it's funny, I'm considered a long timer in campus ministry. Dee Bernhardt, who is here, by the way, has 34 years, I believe. If you want somebody who's a real long timer, Dee's, Dee's a long timer. So here, here's the crux of the matter. You could call those missionary disciples, though, if you want to sum it up in one word, an apostle. Because what is an apostle? It's one who is sent. One who has already decided to follow Jesus and now knows that they have an identity and a mission, and it, it means to go. They share in the mission of going and sharing good news. And I will tell you, if you're like me, when I was growing up, I didn't think the church had good news. Because I thought the church was full of a bunch of no's. Don't do this, don't do that, no, you can't do this, no, 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 no. What I came to realize after I came to decide I wanted to make Jesus the center of my life was, actually it's full of yeses, I just didn't even know how to articulate them and didn't hear about them. And this is the crux of what I'm going to tell you, is that when we accompany a student on a college campus nowadays, you cannot start with doctrine, behavior, or anything else. You start with a relationship. You don't even start with a relationship with Jesus. You start with a relationship with you and another human being who is made in God's image and likeness, who has a dignity that's been planted within them that, you, that, that makes the cosmos seem like nothing, that has a will that can choose to love God and other people. That's who they are. They're a reflection of the divine trinity. That's who they are. They're sons and daughters adopted by God into his family. That's who our college students are. And if that's who they are, then don't they deserve good news? Don't they deserve to live in a relationship with our God? But they got to start by understanding and building the bridges of trust between you and I and with the church, because a lot of them don't trust the church. Because the church, if it's like it was for me, is a big no. Now, I would pose this question then. If most people don't know who they are, their own identity as children of God, how are they going to know how to live? They're not. They really aren't. And, and that's actually the whole problem with our church. We've lost our identity as a church. We have because I want you to stop and think about what does being Catholic mean to the average Catholic, not necessarily to you, who are leaders in the church. What does it mean to the average Catholic in the average parish, in the average town, in average USA? Somebody want to give me a couple of words? Aaron, you're from Canada. That doesn't count. I said USA. Go ahead. Mm. And, and we can define that however we wish, right? But I will tell you this. What a great discussion starter. So, so tell me, what do you think a good person is? And just shut up and listen. I think, you know, if you're like me also, I, I'm a guy, and guys tend toward this a little bit more. I'm a fixer, okay? I've been married for 21 years now, and my wife, she knows if, if I come to my husband with a problem, I, I sometimes have to preface it with, I just want you to listen, right? And I've learned over 21 years that I'm not supposed to, li to fix my wife. I still sometimes have that thing like, it rises up inside me, and I'm like, okay, if you just did this, you wouldn't have this problem, but you know, and I have to tamp it down and just listen. It's the same thing our students are looking for. They want somebody to, to listen. Not just provide all the answers for them. But I'll get back to that in a minute. So this Catholic identity crisis is really the underlying issue, the root of the problem that lies in a lot of our church today. We don't know who we are, so we don't know how we ought to live. We don't know how we're supposed to act. So therefore, we don't act, and therefore, we're not missionary, and therefore, we're not evangelizing. Okay, this is a conference about new evangelization. We haven't, we've talked about what the new evangelization is, but we haven't even talked about evangelization proper. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people at this conference, God bless you, who probably have a different understanding of evangelization than what the church has an understanding of evangelization. And if my understanding of evangelization is different, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But what I want to do is I want to, I want to at least get us on the same playing field, okay? The Catechism and the documents of Vatican II very clearly state that evangelization it includes not only the witness of life, but also the ex exclamation explicitly of good news, the gospel message, the kerygma. And I will tell you that most Catholics could not tell you good news uh, within a short, succinct, little Jesus Christ has come to save you kind of 
you know, give me a couple of minutes to talk about Jesus and why you believe in him. Most people couldn't, couldn't tell you what the hope is that they have. Most Catholics. Surveys have shown they don't know what the curriculum is. So part of the problem is we're not doing it because we don't know who we are. Now listen to this. This is from Paul VI. And I'm, this is one of my favorite quotes. I'm guessing a lot of you have heard this before because it's quoted a lot. But this is basically about evangelization first. Evangelizing is, in fact, the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. Let's stop there for a second. Who is the church? You are. What's your identity? Your identity is to be evangelists. She exists in order to evangelize. Stop right there for a second. If you ask the average Catholic, why does the Catholic Church exist? What, is she gonna, what, are, the, what, is, what are the average people in a parish going to say? Sacraments. That, that might be a, a, a top answer. What else? Serve the poor, maybe? To, to help out other people, to bring people together in community? I, stop and think about it this way. What is the mission statement of the parish that you attend? But I will tell you this. If it's not born out of the mission that's given to the church, then there's the wrong mission statement. It's really speaking about other things that aren't right here. I hate to put it that way, but that's the truth. I mean, if our deepest identity is to evangelize, and we exist to evangelize, why do we come up with all these creative mission statements that talk all about it, but don't, do, don't talk about the core of what the mission is? And then, it, it, and then he defines it. That is to say, in order, evangel, it exists in order to evangelize. That is to say, in order to preach and teach, to be the channel of the gift of grace, to reconcile sinners with God, and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass. So yes, we have to do these other things. And yes, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith, right? Yes to all these other things. Yes, we have to go out and serve the poor. And yes, but the reason we do that is because our hope, our faith, our love is found in Jesus Christ. And notice, I use the name Jesus. I just want you to know, know I don't speak about just the Lord, and I don't just speak about God, because I will tell you, the fullness of revelation of that God, of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Trinity, is found in the person of Jesus and we need to get over the, the code of silence that we have in our church about speaking his name as if it's something bad. That is who he is. Please, I beg you, Catholics, start saying Jesus all the time, okay? It helps us to break the code. Uh, and you notice, the bishops echo this at the Synod of Bishops for the New Evangelization. Being Christian, and then they put it in scare quotes, I don't know why, being church, um, means, <laughs> you know, scare quotes are what the, all the... Uh, reporters use when they don't like something and they put it in square quotes to, to set it off so that you're like, oh, goodness, that's bad. Okay, anyway, it, that's not the point here, but I jumped off the page at me. I'm sorry. You'll notice if you ever listen to anything I ever present, I go off on wild tangents. Okay, being Christian and being church means being missionary. You are all called to be missionaries. I consider myself a missionary at Texas A&M University. That's my job. Before anything else I do, before I have to go do some administrative thing, before I have to hire somebody, before I have to handle this staff of 60-something people, before all that stuff, I got to, I am, I am a missionary. And that person who's right in front of me is the most important thing in the world. And how often do I forget that? Being church means being missionary. One is or is not. That's strong language, folks. We either take it on or we leave it behind. It's the same thing. What did Jesus say? Those who are with us, you know, let everybody join. But you know what? If you're against us, you're out. And, and I will tell you, there is actually a, and Sherry Waddell talks about this in her book as well, there is a practical universalism in our church right now. What, do I, what does she mean by that? She, she, she would argue that in the way we operate in the church, we assume that everybody's going to heaven. I want you to stop and think about that assumption. Have you made the assumption in the way you operate, in a classroom, or in a parish, or, or in a campus ministry, wherever you are, that pretty much everybody's kind of what everyone was saying, a good person? And even if you don't necessarily believe that, is that how we operate? We operate as if, well, God, God loves everybody, God's gonna, God's gonna wanna bring them to heaven. But what does the Bible say? What does the church tradition say? What does, what does every single document the church has ever put out say? What do the saints say? 
They say the road is narrow and hard. I mean, what did we have this last week? Those who are rich will struggle to inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, everybody in this room is rich compared to the average person in the world. If you work for the church, you may not think so, but you are, okay? So here, we either are or we're not. And how, how often do we have this universalism that kind of invades and we assume that we don't need to be missionary? We don't need to evangelize. We don't need to preach the gospel. We don't need to talk about these things because it makes me uncomfortable. And I will, I will readily admit, I do this, even though I know it all the time, and I'm going to have to answer for these things. Now this is, again, it's not public confession time, but it's true. What do I do when I get, I get on, you know, I go and I, I, I speak all over the country and things like this about evangelization, and lo and behold, I will get on a plane, and somebody will be next to me who will want to talk about what I do for a living. You know what I want to do when I get on a plane? I don't want to be Pope Francis and be misquoted. I want to take my, my Bose noise-canceling headphones and I want to put them on. Because I just want to, you know, tune out for a little while, right? And I have this little inner debate with God sometimes in my prayer on a plane. And I think to him, you know, you're going to probably sit somebody who's talkative right next to me, aren't you? Or somebody who's going to see what I'm reading, you know, if I bring some, you know, Catholic nerd book along with me. And, you know, it's, it's going to have some, you know, catchy title. And somebody's going to say, ooh, what are you reading there? All right, let's do this. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, it's not just that. It's every day when you're not ready, when you're walking to your car and you're, you get in the mode, I'm going home, and somebody stops you and wants to talk. It's every inconvenient time is when we're called to evangelize. And I will tell you, this is exactly what happened to Jesus, right? What happens? I want to be all alone. I'm Jesus right now. I want to be all alone. I'm walking along, doing my own little thing. Lo and behold, here comes a crowd of people. So it's, you know, the Bible tells us all the time, especially in the Gospel of Mark. So immediately he stops and he ministers to them. And he, he heals their sick. He casts out demons. He does all these things. You can, you, I mean, I'm just imagining Jesus as an introvert who's probably like, look, I need some me time. Can I just get away from you peeps for a little while? And they're, ah, Jesus, 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 you know. I mean, Bishop Barron's got it bad enough. I mean, <laughs> let's take a selfie, Bishop. You know, so... Imagine if Jesus had cell phones. He'd be on Instagram all the time. So the bishops go on. Loving one's faith implies bearing witness to it. Ouch. I know I've failed this. Bringing it to others and allowing others to participate in it. The lack of missionary zeal is a lack of zeal for the faith. Hmm. This is convicting. I don't know if it is for you, but it's convicting for me because I know there are times this happens, right? And on a campus, in the academic environment, a lot of you who are academics, I know that it's difficult. There are expectations. There's the search for tenure, and then you get tenure, and then you get lazy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but you, what happens, I've worked around the ivory tower for nearly 20 years now, and I will tell you, I know what it's like. It's competitive. It can be cutthroats in some places. It can be very difficult, especially in public institutions. And there are expectations that you will behave yourself. Christian, you keep your faith compartmentalized, Catholic, and we'll all get okay, get along okay. But if you can't do that, there's going to be problems. And for campus ministers, it's kind of like, okay, you guys, you stay right across the street, and everybody's going to be fine with you doing your thing over there. You have your worship service, and you have your stuff. But if you start invading our space, this is our space, you don't bring that stuff to bear here in the academic world. These are pressures. But culture is changed on college campuses. Can we agree upon that? That the culture, the wider culture, is transformed a lot at what happens on, on college campuses. And with 90% of our Catholic college students going to non-Catholic institutions, who has the biggest chance to transform culture but that 90%, which is the largest number of any religious group in the, in the country. If we want to change things, we got to change things on our college campuses. And we're called in the new evangelization to not only evangelize individuals, but cultures and peoples. Not to make them homogenous, but to transform them for, for God, for the sake of God. So, on the con this is the lack of missionary zeal is a lack of zeal for the faith. On the contrary, faith is made stronger by transmitting it. The Pope's words on the new evangelization can be translated in a rather direct and crucial question. 
Are we interested in transmitting the faith and bringing non-Christians to the faith? Are we truly missionary at heart? These are convicting questions. And this is why I told you up front, I hope that there's some challenge for you. I hope that you will think through and pray through some of these things. And how, how do we operate within our campus ministries, within our parishes, and these other things? John Paul II wrote this. The Second Vatican Council sought to renew the church's life and activity in the light and needs of the contemporary world. And if there's anywhere the contemporary world comes to bear, it's at colleges and universities, correct? The council emphasized the church's missionary nature, basing it in a dynamic way on the Trinitarian mission itself. The missionary thrust, therefore, belongs to the very nature of the Christian life. Again, it's restating what we've already stated, right? So, so here we have somebody who wants to say yes to Jesus Christ. How do we get to that point anyway? How do we get there? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is what the Pope has been talking about accompanying others. And Cardinal Worrell talked about this, accompaniment. I think this word is great, because it doesn't mean you necessarily have to get in front and pull them along, nor are you behind them trying to keep them from going in the wrong direction, right? You're pulling them back. You're walking alongside them. You're walking alongside somebody. And I will tell you that a real missionary, you know, if you look at the best evangelists and you can start to look at markers of what makes them good evangelists, they understand that this is not very easy nor is it going to be efficient. And I want to say this again, it is not efficient. This is not a classroom by which we're going to all stand, you know, I'm just going to tell you a whole bunch of stuff like I'm doing right now, and therefore you're going to lay down your life for God and you're going to be transformed. That's not how it works. It's inefficient in the sense of you have to walk with people in their mess and their muck of their lives, and you have to really love them right there. Now, I will tell you, because I'm in campus ministry, I work with young men and women who are in the midst of pornography, and I'm going to use this as a one way of accompanying people. When I got into campus ministry, within the first month I was in my office, I had the first, person, first student walk into my office and say, I'm struggling with pornography, and I can't stop. I've tried to stop multiple times, and I can't get more than a few weeks. What do I do? And I went, mm. <laughs> this was 15 years ago. You know, there was no resource out there in the Catholic world at that time. I looked. There was nothing. Uh, so I started looking for non-Catholic resources, and I ran into a man named Patrick Carnes, who, if any of you know, uh, Patrick Carnes is kind of the father of sex addiction studies. He, he has really helped to bring sex addiction into the mainstream of the social sciences uh, and has done some very good work. And I started to read his books, and I learned a lot, but I also learned I still didn't know enough. And I was working at Texas Tech, which had an addictive studies program. And it's a real unique program, and I called over there, and of course most of what they work with are going to be alcoholics and drug addicts and others, right? And what do you do traditionally? You go to inpatient treatment centers, and then you come out. Uh, and then hopefully you'd, you'd probably join a 12-step group or something else, right? Get some counseling. I called him and I said, okay, who does sex addiction? And it was like hot potato even in that office, okay? And they were, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Hey, does Joe do it in the back? I think he's got a closet and he does some sex addiction stuff, you know? And that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what I got. And it ended up that there were two LDS professors. So they were... And what's interesting is in Lubbock, there's a, a large Mormon temple, so they, they're a large LDS population in, in Lubbock, Texas. And these guys were, have been studying this stuff for years now. And they had come up with their own addictive cycle, they had come up with their own treatment, and they had actually started to work with a couple of pastors to try to implement some of this stuff. And they said, oh great, we don't have a Catholic who's come to us yet. Would you mind if we put a, a guy who's he's got his PhD, just needs his counseling hours, and you could take your Catholic stuff, whatever that is, and you can wet it to the science, and you guys go learn how to do this stuff. And we did. We did it for a year where we ran a small group for men who are struggling with porn addiction. And I have to tell you, I learned a whole lot through doing this with this man. Uh, lo and behold, come you know, 15 years later, and what's end up happening, but it's just the problem has expanded to the rate we have now, where nearly 90% of young men who are in your college campuses regularly look at pornography, 
and one-third to 40%, depending on the study you look at, of young women. So it's not just a guy's problem. I just want to FYI on that one. Um, yes? Yes. And the ages that they start is, uh, I personally know of several kids who are single digit, who friends, their kids had started looking at it. So I don't want to get into this too much. The, the point is to frame it in this right here. So when I started to learn about this stuff, I started to really learn what it means to accompany somebody. And let me tell you why. Because an addict, if, if anybody's ever worked with addicts before in a pastoral setting, or even in a, a clinical one, you will know that addiction is not something that just goes away. You can't pray it away. You can't just think it away. You can't just talk it away. It is a lifelong battle. So if you want to accompany somebody with this through addiction, you're in their muck. And I remember one time there was a guy who'd been in our group for a couple of years. And I had given these guys my cell phone because I have really good boundaries and I generally say, you know, don't call me when I go home or I turn off my phone or something. But for these guys, I had given my cell phone and I said, you can call me anytime you need to, if you have to. You first call your accountability partner, but if you need to get me, because you can't. And I got a call one time at 10 o'clock at night. And he said, hey, I did it again. I don't think I deserve to live. He was suicidal. So I said, where are you right now? I went and met him. Uh, I'd been trained also to, to deal with po persons who were suicidal in crisis situations, and I helped to talk him back off of that stuff. Um, that guy has been sexually sober for years now. Uh, but it took me entering into his mess and willing to leave my family in the middle of the night to go spend hours with this guy, and it took me saying, you know what, I love you enough that you're not just a project, you're a person, you're my brother, and I want what's best for you. And what's best for you is that you come to love Jesus Christ, you follow him, and then you share in his mission. That's our job, folks. And again, it's not efficient. But that's what accompaniment looks like. And when they have tough questions, because like Carolyn Wu said, you know, there, there are really tough questions and good questions. What are we doing to allow spaces for them to ask those questions? Where are they? And I will tell you, in a lot of Catholic con contexts, there's two extremes that have problem, problematic results for me. One is the extreme where you're not allowed to ask the questions, I'm just gonna give you all the answers. That's one extreme, okay? The other extreme is it's just a bunch of questions and we're never gonna provide any answer at any point. That's the other extreme. Catholic academia, in a lot of ways, can struggle with this, but even in Catholic context of campus ministry, I've seen campus ministry struggle with this. So what does it look like? Well, in accompanying other people, when you evangelize somebody, it means I walk alongside you and your questions are okay. And ultimately, I wanna to get to the questions, but it's really about I love you, and I'm gonna help you love God more, and we'll get to your questions eventually. And I will, I'll frame it in this way. Look at what Pope Francis says, because I love his stuff about evangelization. Mission is at once a passion for Jesus and a passion for his people. You can sum up Pope Francis in that statement right there. I, uh, that's how I think of our Pope right now, is in this phrase, mission is at once a passion for Jesus and a passion for his people. This is out of Evangelii Gaudium. When we stand before Jesus crucified, we see the depth of his love which exalts and sustains us. But at the same time, unless we're blind, we begin to realize that Jesus' gaze, burning with love, expands to embrace all his people. So he came to save you, but he came to save everybody. But he saves all of us through relationship with other people. And salvation is on the line. So here, stop and ask yourself, we talked about the assumption earlier of kind of a practical universalism. What would your campus ministry, what would your classroom look like, what would your parish look like if we stopped making that assumption and we made the assumption that until I really enter into a relationship with that other person, I don't know what this, what, where they're headed. And I may never know it because, you know what, that's for God alone to judge, but what if I assume that that person needs to be evangelized, that they've never heard the gospel message, and that they've never said yes to Jesus Christ, and that they are not an intentional disciple right now? What would I do then? And I gotta tell you, if you look at the book of Acts, 
if you look at the early church, every single thing that they did was, my eyes are on heaven, my eyes are on the people that are in front of me, and I think that they deserve to hear about heaven. And I will tell you, I, I was even more convicted about this by an atheist than anybody else in the church. Than anybody in the church. And some of you have probably seen this, and I, I, I like talking about this story, but it, it's important for us to hear. Do you all know who Penn and Teller are? Okay, they're the illusionists, the entertainers. They're also atheists. Penn Jillette is uh, the one who talks. He's the big guy. He's actually an extremely intelligent human being. He's very well spoken. And he did a video blog. You can find this on YouTube uh, if you want to go look at this. But I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. He basically said this. After the show tonight, that they do in Vegas, uh, you know, there are people there were signing stuff. And the last guy there, he comes up to me. And I recognize him because we had him on stage at the first show. And anyway, he... He comes up and he says, look, I'm going I'm to tell you that was a great show. And he was looking me in the eye. You know, I could tell this was a good guy because he shook my hand, he looked me in the eye, and he was very complimentary. He's just nice and, and gentle and kind. And he, he just spoke with a way you could tell he's a good man. But he told me, he said, look, I want to be honest with you up front. I'm a Christian, and I know you're not, and, and I hope one day you will be. And I want to give you this. And he pulled out a little Bible, and he gave it to him, and he said, you know, he even wrote a little note in there. And, and Penn says, you know, I'm not going to be, become a Christian because some guy hands me a Bible. I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to tell you, this was a good man. And there are some atheists and even some Christians who would say, look, you shouldn't go and evangelize these people. You shouldn't talk about this. You shouldn't shove your faith down people's throats. And I'm going to tell you, this is Penn Jillette, who's an atheist, by the way. These are, these are the words that convicted me right here. I'm going to tell you that if heaven and hell are real, that you can really spend an eternity away from God, how much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them about it? So church, I ask you this question. Do you believe heaven and hell are real? Because if you do, then what are you going to do? I don't think we could not share this message with other people. And not because, oh, I think all you other people, you slobs are going to hell. That's not, the, that's not it. But it's also wrong to make the, the opposite assumption, oh, I think all you good people are going to heaven. How about we don't assume either way? And we start to operate that our job is to enter into a relationship with people and help them hear the good news. Now, you know the Catholic escape clause that's widely attributed to St. Francis, right? <laughs> Preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words. You guys, I, you know that better than Bible, okay? And let me tell you why. It's the Catholic escape clause. And why is it? Because it's always unnecessary to use words if you ask most Catholics. <laughs> Never ever is it necessary. I'll just be holy. Well, who in here is living a perfectly holy life? Good. I'm glad nobody raised their hands, okay? I'm not either. I know I can't do that, so I'm going to have a false witness in a sense with my life. I better fill in some words. I mean, even St. Paul would say in his letters, I have not give, been given the gift to preach. I'm not good, well-trained of tongue. But how many people came to believe in Jesus Christ because he passionately, truly believed and he shared that with people? God can work through your insufficiencies, folks. Do you believe that? Because I think Pope Francis does. He goes on, he says this. We realize once more that he wants to take use of us and draw us closer to his beloved people. He takes us from the midst of his people and he sends us to his people. Without the sense of belonging, we cannot understand our deepest identity. Again, it goes back to that, right? So I'm going to steal something um, from a, a, a couple of different sources, but I want to tell you about a process of evangelization that the new evangelization really needs to focus in on. Because what is new evangelization? Well, first of all, it's right. It's new order, new expressions, new methods, right? Now, first of all, are your parishes actually participating in anything new? then can you say that your parish, if it's not, is participating in the new evangelization? And how much more ardor do we actually have when we ourselves aren't doing it and we're the leaders of the Catholic Church? And then it's also supposed to be to those people who, or, or those cultures, or those individuals who were once Christian and who no longer are. Where are you going to find a good majority of them? Right in the midst of the university. Between 18 and 24, 80% of people who decide they're not going to practice the Catholic faith anymore decide between those ages. 
80% from 18 to 24. If there's anywhere that mission identity, therefore, needs to be expressed explicitly and boldly, it's in those age groups when they're there. And why is that? Because they're asking the big questions and they're willing to take risks. This last weekend, I had a transitional deacon who was on the altar this last Sunday celebrating because he had gotten ordained the day before and he was at our parish. When he was a freshman, he came into my office literally shaking, saying, I, I want to learn more about being Catholic. He wasn't Catholic at the time. He was asking big questions and he just wanted somebody to, to help him out, to listen to him and to enter into his life. Deacon Doug is a deacon of the Catholic Church. He's going to be a priest next year because I and several other people decided, hey, you know what? He's worthy of my, the investment of my time. And if there's anything I will never regret, it's investing my life in a young person. And as a father of five kids, I will tell you, any of you in here who are parents know, what, what is the one regret you'll probably have? I didn't spend enough time with my kids. Every time I leave, what do I, every time I leave to come do one of these conferences, it hurts my heart because I'm not at home with my kids. Because they're only going to be there for a few short more years. But what about those kids that are in college? They're in our midst for even a shorter amount of time. Here's the process of evangelization, and it needs to be new in all these ways. First of all, it's the pre-evangelization stage, right? The church talks about this in things like the you know, direct, general directory of catechesis and other things. Establish, this is where you establish relationship. It's where you build friendship. It's where you get to know somebody and you invite them in. I had a group of young students who, who I invited to, to join a small group of men and I invited them into my house. The first night, we just got to know each other. The second night, we just got to know each other. The third night, we just got to know each other before we really started getting into some other stuff. That was pre-evangelization. And then there's the initial proclamation. This is an explicit proclamation of the gospel, good news that by our very nature, we have been separated from God to the point that we cannot save ourselves and that we're in need of His grace, right? And so He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, in order to heal that relationship. But it doesn't stop there. We have to choose it. And I'll quote Sherry Waddell again, God has no grandchildren. One of my favorite phrases. The faith, I, I got to tell that to 2,500 Canadian teens last week uh, during a graduation ceremony, and I told them, you in here, the 2,500 high school seniors who are about to be college freshmen, will have the, every opportunity to go and choose something that will not be good for you, but you also have every opportunity to choose Jesus Christ. Every opportunity to choose to go to Mass the first Sunday you step on campus when you go to college. Every opportunity to say, yes, I'm going to start saying my prayers even though my mom and dad aren't asking me to, because their faith cannot be your faith. Parents can't believe for their children, and therefore God has no grandchildren. My job as a dad is to evangelize my children. And I will tell you right now, that means sometimes I have to parent differently than other people because if I want a one in a million child, I better not parent like the other million parents around me. Otherwise, they're just going to turn out the same way. The third step, so we got pre-evangelization, number one, initial proclamation, number two. The third is the initial conversion. This is the first, maybe the first time, or maybe you're doing it, where one chooses to follow Jesus. Now, for some people, this is going to be like, for me, I had stopped going to church for several years. I was living a pagan lifestyle. I was off the deep end. You know that guy in college that you all have worked with that really just gets under your skin? That was me. I'm still getting under your skin, but now I've come to Jesus, okay? So, but you have to do it. I, my, mine was a big kind of Pauline conversion. Other people are going to kind of, you know, I've always been Catholic. I've always gone to church. I've always done this. I, have, I had a young man, he's always prayed every day of his life, always gone to church. And then one day, woke up when he was 26 years old, he'd already been married, already doing his duty in a sense, and said to himself, I really haven't taken hold of truly following after Jesus passionately. And I want to do that. And he came to me and he said, can I do that? And he's now helping me walk with more students so that he's now, we're engaging him in helping us do the work of campus ministry. That's number three. Number four is initi initiatory catechesis. 
And this is where we apprentice into the content of the faith. And here we're going to step back from our little Catholic bubble, and I want you to stop and think about this. Which one comes first, evangelization or catechesis? No, they, they got it right. It's evangelization. So why is evangelization first? Well, let me ask you this. How do you fix the problem of Catholics who don't give money? Do you preach about it a whole lot more, Father? Is it any of you priests? Is that going to fix it, just preaching about it? No. It's not going to fix it. It might get a few more bucks in there because of the Catholic guilt, right? But is it going to fix the problem that's at the core? No. What's going to fix it is that when people really start to follow Jesus Christ. People who follow Jesus Christ are going to give more. People who follow Jesus Christ are going to want to learn about the one they've fallen in love with. And I'll put it like this. When I, when I started dating my wife, I, and I fell in love with her, and all that emotional stuff happened, and then it sank down into a deep, deep love where I actually choose it on a day in, day out, even if I don't feel like I love my wife, I still want to know about her. I want to know her deeply. And I want to know what she cares about. And I want to know how she wants to live her life. And I want to know her dreams. And I want to know what she struggles with. And it's the same thing with Jesus. When you fall in love with him, you're going to want to learn about him. And you're going to want to learn about his church. And you're going to want to learn how to live your life. And you're going to want to make decisions around that. So if we start with behavior or money or all these other issues, what have we done? We started with catechetical stuff or doctrine or morality. And it fails because then all they think of the Catholic Church is the list of no's or this is how you're supposed to do things, or this is what you're supposed to know. And that's why we have so many Catholic kids who go through a Catholic education and then right out. Because they don't have the relationship part. It's relationship. So, are we, what time we got? Oh, we got, we got plenty of time. What am I talking about? Okay. So, catechesis is one aspect of the evangelical process of evangelization. Okay? And it plays an important part. But what, what do we focus our energies on in our parishes and campus ministries? Catechesis and formation. What is, the, what is the number one thing that the average Catholic will tell you, what do we need to do better to fix all these problems? We need to catechize people better. They just don't know the faith. There can be an intellectual conversion. Don't get me wrong, where somebody learns something about God or the church, and then that thing starts to be the impetus which starts to push. Because the Holy Spirit can use just about anything, right, for conversion. But the... The primary way Jesus evangelized people was never through catechesis, doctrine, or formation. It was through healing. It was through relationship and touch and care of the individual. It was through service. And it was through preaching good news. And we've forgotten that. So number five would be adherence. Adherence means the faith has to be lived out. We start, I start to live the life of a disciple, one who follows Jesus. Think about, I want you to think about what happened with the apostles. What did he do? First, he built a relationship with them, and then he calls them into relationship. There's an initial proclamation that happens. There's the conversion. They choose to follow him. And then there's this formation that happened for three years, right? And then what happened? They had to choose it. Eleven of them did. One of them didn't. It was choice for Judas to say no. And then finally, they're sent that's the last one. Number six is missionary initiative. They're sent out. This is the process of evangelization. It's not a one and done, I'm just going to preach the gospel. But that's the core of it. If you don't have that, then what do we have? And I will tell you, I'm, I'm going to challenge some of you priests in the room real quick, okay? Because I love you. First of all, your homiletics professor was probably awful. Now, if any of you in here are homiletics professors, I apologize, okay? And let me tell you why the homiletics professors are awful. Because... Father Vince Christie is downstairs right now, and he's talking about fundraising. And he's, tell, he's framing it, I know his talk, because he was my mentor in teaching me how to fundraise, okay? Guy was, guy's awesome, you should have gone to his talk. So anyway, so, <laughs> so Father Vince will frame it in this, you know, that when you're going into a big donor's house, you have to sell a vision, right? But if you don't go for the ask, you're never going to get the money. Preachers, priests, sell great visions from the pulpits in our Catholic Church, I have heard some of the best preaching, and it's getting better, which, thank you, it is getting better in a lot of places, but we're still not going for the ask. 
because we think it's ultra holy or too evangelical or something like that. You have to challenge people to say, now is the acceptable day of salvation, as Paul says. Now is the time to choose him. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, drop your nets, people, and do it right now. He didn't say wait. He didn't say, here, let me preach good news, and then I'm going to walk away. He preached good news and then said, now you choose. Make an act of faith. So the next time you guys who get to the pulpit preach good news, which is getting much and much better and has been done throughout the entire course of history, but we've forgotten to go for the ask. Stop and say, right now, let's pray congregation, let's pray parish, let's pray people of God to choose Him today. And how can you do that concretely? And you ask God, how am I supposed to live this out? If I choose to follow you, what does that mean I have to do differently? That's where we go. Because... To be a disciple means something's got to change, right? You've got to serve the poor. You've got to heal the sick and the brokenhearted. You've got to be in these people's lives. I know there are people who have evangelized me in my life, and I owe them everything. Everything. I was on the road to perdition, folks. I had broken every Ten Commandments there was, taken the Ten Commandments, cracked them over my knee, and then tossed them out the window to the, to the golden calf, okay? I was that guy. I owe my salvation. And it is true. I believe there is a heaven and hell. And I believe I was on the path to hell. And I believe that I am now on the path to heaven. What more could I want but than to have other people join me on this path, right? So, listen to this. This is from the USCCB's Go and Make Disciples. Unless we undergo conversion, we have not truly accepted the gospel. And then, right, right out of Vatican II... A true apostle looks for opportunities to announce Christ by words, addressed either to non-believers with a view of leading them to faith or to the faithful with a view of instructing, strengthening, and encouraging them to a more fervent life. Our job, that's what our job is. And so if there's ever anywhere missionary discipleship is needed, it's in higher education. And I hope I've at least convinced you of that fact and that the gospel needs to be proclaimed there. 